The White Pill is available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. This is going to be an extremely special and important episode, in my opinion. We have with us Gabe Shipton. He is Julian Assange's brother. He's the producer of the film Ithaca, which tells the story of Julian's political imprisonment through the eyes of his wife and their shared dad. Gabe, uh, you're in Australia right now, correct? Yeah, that's right, Michael. Good to be uh, with you this morning. So I have a lot of questions to discuss. I personally made it a point not to do my homework for this episode because in my opinion, and I don't think it's really a controversial one, uh, your brother Julian Assange is probably the B, the biggest political prisoner on earth today. Uh, there is an enormous amount of disinformation and misinformation about him in the media. In my view, and I don't think this is controversial either, this is by design. Uh, there is very much an attempt to muddy the waters to make it seem like there's some ambiguity about what he's being put through uh, and what he's being accused of. In my view, there is not much ambiguity there at all. Uh, he's being treated far worse than people who have literally been caught murdering uh, fingerprints on film and so on and so forth. Uh, and the conditions he's under are less than ideal, less than civilized, to put it mildly. Um, one of the things I'm sure on some level, there's a part of you that is sick of answering the same questions over and over. But on the other hand, I imagine there's a party that's like, look, every day that my brother is behind bars, that means I have a duty to, yes, maybe it's annoying to repeat the same questions over and over, but as long as he's there, you know, I have to carry that burden. Is, is that an accurate representation? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a battle of narratives, uh, you know, and, and that's what, that's a lot of the work that we do. Me, uh, Stella, Julian's wife, and John is, 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 is changing that narrative, changing those as you said, the, the misconceptions, the muddied waters, uh, and really getting uh, the facts out, uh, the truth about the case. And so that's uh, exactly right. We, we do this a lot, and um, that's part of uh, you know, our advocacy work for Julian. So let's, let me tell, let, I'm going to repeat the, the narrative that Karen believes, which, and here's the other thing that drives me crazy, and, and before we get to that, um, the same corporate journalists who have meltdowns if Taylor Lorenz has a nasty tweet directed at her on Twitter uh, seem to have little concern and regard that as an affront to the First Amendment, seem to have little concern about your brother being incarcerated in an embassy for years without literal sunlight, uh, then dragged about forcibly and put behind bars. Um, it's. I would love to hear your thoughts on this kind of, I don't know if I'd use the word hypocrisy, but how would you regard it? Yeah, well, I think that's uh, yeah, exactly right. It's hypocrisy, um, you know, elite, these sort of elite class of journalists who put themselves, you know, above everybody else. It's like they're in their own little club, um, you know, and they all band together and protect each other. But Julian, uh, through and through Julian, Julian and through his work at WikiLeaks, uh, really exposed, uh, you know, the corporate media, the legacy media, or, or you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, and how it functions arm in arm with, uh, you know, co corporations and government and the military and uh, the intelligence services. So uh, these, uh, you know, these elite journalists and, um, you know, we're all exposed for doing the dirty work uh, of, of the military industrial complex of, um, of, of corporations around the world and the government. So uh, I'm not surprised that there's no love lost, uh, you know, on, on, on Julian's case. And they have, uh, in the recent history, they have, um, you know, started to realize that, uh, you know, this attack on Julian, you know, also could potentially affect them, you know, it's uh, criminalizing uh, the work that, uh, that they do uh, in communicating with their sources, publishing yes. uh, classified information. So, you know, we've seen uh, some of them come around uh, and begin to uh, defend Julian, uh, calling on the Garland Department of Justice to uh, drop this. You know, most famously, I think last at the end of last year was the New York Times wrote a letter to the Garland Department of Justice, uh, 
uh, calling for them to end the end the endless prosecutions against Julian. So there has been a little bit of a um, a little bit of a a change, uh, but definitely it, it is uh, you know corporate journalism. It's a it's an elite club, and and if you didn't go to the right schools or if you didn't go to if you didn't work your way up through these uh, corporate news organisations, you know you're you're not one of them, uh, and 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 that's how they see Julian. That's a that's a George Carlin joke. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. <laughs> um, I'm gladdened to hear that about the New York Times. I was not aware of that, so I've lifted them a few rungs in hell. Let let me give you the uh, corporate narrative about Julian, what he did, and then you can debunk it uh, as effectively as possible. People who are familiar with his name and are not really as aware of what the circumstances were, okay? So this is, again, the narrative that someone who's not paying attention is going to believe. This is, these are not my views. Uh, Julian Assange, who is directly employed by Putin, hacked into several computers uh, that would make Hillary Clinton and other organizations look bad. He released this Russian disinformation in order to screw things up in the American government. Uh, he, as a result of some of this information being made public, many of our spies were killed. Uh, and he's not a journalist. He's far closer to a terrorist. So that is how he's very much been framed, as you were painfully aware, over the years by uh, some of the most evil people on earth. Can you break down point by point why that is incorrect? Well, I mean, it's a lot, lot to... You know, you, you've uh, sure, covered, covered that, a lot of ground. A lot of lies yeah, yeah, co covered a lot of ground there with with that with that statement. But you know, I guess uh, you know the you go back to the Podesta and the DNC uh, emails uh, that were published in the lead up to the 2016 election. Uh, those, you know, the DNC actually sued WikiLeaks. You know, <laughs> tried to sue WikiLeaks in the Southern District of New York, and the judge. A judge there found that those uh, that those publishing those emails was uh, you know protected under the First Amendment and was newsworthy uh, and was in the public interest. Uh, those emails exposed uh, corruption inside uh, the Democratic National Committee, corruption inside the Hillary Clinton campaign, and a real life provable conspiracy. Uh, that existed within the Democratic National Committee uh, to take uh, to rob the the nomination uh, from uh, the rightful nominee, who would have been Bernie Sanders, had everything played out, you know, as it should have been, and and give it to uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, and so that that uh, conspiracy led to uh, you know Donna Brazile resigning uh, and and a, and a whole lot of other re resignations uh, from. Uh, the Democratic uh, National uh, Committee. So, you know, that's let's that's one section of it. You know, the newsworthiness, uh, the impact of uh, the impact of that uh, those uh, leaks and publishing them, and, and the corruption and and the the conspiracies that that uh, that they exposed. I think a lot of people on the left, uh, you know, forget that uh, that the candidate that they actually wanted, Bernie Sanders, was was uh, was robbed, um, and 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 the polling at the time actually showed that uh, you know Trump versus Sanders, Sanders would uh, would, would 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 win that election, uh, and so uh, it's it's that conspiracy led by the Clinton campaign that sort of um, you know uh, it was a sort of shot, shot themselves in the foot in a, in a way. I think those emails were also very interesting in that uh, they. Uh, exposed what they called a Pied Piper strategy uh, from within the DNC, and that and that strategy was to uh, influence the corporate media to report more on Donald Trump, uh, not less. And so uh, they they suggested putting Trump forward as as the preferred Republican candidate would assist them, um, and in, and in the end, uh, again another sort of self owned uh, by the Clinton campaign there. Now, uh, this sort of Russian uh, Russian spy uh, angle. Now, this is one of the greatest scandals, you know, of the last, uh, you know, the last ten years. It's 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 almost as good as, or almost as scandalous as the uh, 
great liar around the Iraq war with the with the weapons of mass destruction. You know, but the, with the weapons of mass destruction, you know, the New York Times wrote an apology and said, oh, we got that one wrong. Whereas, uh, you know, with Russiagate, they're, they're sticking uh, sticking to their guns. And, and it became a sort of national obsession with the corporate media, uh, not just around Julian, uh, but also around, um, you know, anyone associated, uh, you know, with Donald Trump. Uh, you know, they all became... May I, may I make one, one point? Yes. I had this tweet where I said, uh, for these types of people, the McCarthy era is both the worst era of American history and the one most necessary to emulate. So it's it's just this just bra I was born in the Soviet Union, by the way. It's just brazen, like, oh my God, this is horrible. What we put these people through, and now you know Nancy Pelosi is freely calling Mitch McConnell, who I have no love for. Let me assure you, as Moscow Mitch, you know, head of this, uh, you know, the Senate Majority Leader. So the the brazenness with which people can be ascribed to, uh, not only just being favorable to Russia, but literally being under Putin's employ with literally no evidence other than they're doing things I don't like. In any other context, we regard it as "have you no shame, sir," and, and things of that nature. Yeah, and and I think you know you, there's there's a lot of um, you know a lot of writing on this, and that goes all the way back to the Steele dossier, which is has shown to be totally uh, fabricated, and then that was planted into the media, and uh, and and it just became this sort of uh, obsession uh, over the last uh, however many years since 2016. Uh, really, and Julian got caught up in that. Um, and most recently, uh, most recently, there was uh, Roger Stone's uh, court case, where you know he's essentially exonerated of having any connection, any connection to Russia or any connection uh, to WikiLeaks. Even the even the Mueller report, uh, you know, uh, which which was originally released redacted, and then the unredacted version exonerated WikiLeaks and Julian of having any. A sort of conspiracy or any connection uh, uh, to, to to Russia. The Durham report uh, essentially did the same thing, uh, you know, exonerating WikiLeaks and and Julian from any of these sort of ties uh, ties to Russia or Putin. It's uh, totally a total fabrication uh, that was used uh, to smear Julian and to uh, really. Um, reduce his con constituency uh, because he had a lot of support uh, on the left, a lot of support among Democrats for his uh, work exposing uh, the war crimes at, uh, around the yeah. Iraq war and, and really this Russiagate narrative, this uh, Putin puppet narrative uh, was used to reduce that, con that constituency and make uh, this prosecution against him uh, more palatable uh, for his uh, previous supporters. Folks, when you dress good, you will look good, you will feel good. And I want to talk to you about Roan, R-H-O-N-E. Men's closets were due for radical reinvention and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Their commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to men. And here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion with their commuter collection. It's got the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, quarter zips, and polos. You don't have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan commuter collection. And their comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility. You can be free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work to your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle with Roan's wrinkle release technology. Wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. And hey, hey, hey. With their Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll smell fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable. Ditch the dry cleaner all together. It looks good, it feels good, and it makes you look like you're stylish. The commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash malice. Use promo code malice, 20% off. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash malice and use code MALICE, it's time to find your corner office comfort with Roan. Hey guys, did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? And if you wake up too hot or too cold, then I recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. They're inspired by NASA, and Miracle Made uses silver-infused fabrics and makes temperature-regulated bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. They're thermoregulating, designed to keep you at the perfect temperature. You get better sleep every night infused with silver the sheets are they prevent up to 99.7 percent of bacterial growth they stay cleaner and fresher three times longer no more gross odors i know a little bit about that 
Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag for other luxury brands. Feel as nice, if not nicer, than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping in bacteria, which can clog your pores, which causes breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Here's what you got to do. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice to try Miracle made sheets today. And if you're buying them for yourself as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use code malice at checkout, you get three free towels and save another 20%. Here's the kicker. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice. Use code malice. Get your three-piece towel set for free and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash malice to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back to the show. Um, let's, uh, so let's two other points that are just lies about him in the press that I obviously want to hear from your mouth. One is that he was a hacker, uh, who hacked information that he had no right to possess. Well, I mean, that's, uh, you know, WikiLeaks has, uh, you know, it's never been, uh, prosecuted for hacking. It's, it's never, uh, there's never been any, um, any sort of, uh, charges laid for, for that, for that sort of, um, for that sort of activity. Uh, there was uh, part of this current indictment. There was an attempt uh, in the indictment to paint Julian, uh, you know, as a as a hacker. And the only person, the only person the uh, FBI and the Department of Justice could find was a, a convicted fraudster, convicted pedophile, uh, who was willing to give a witness statement on the record in exchange for immunity. He is an Icelandic man, Tordeson. Uh, and this man gave, uh, actually was a volunteer at WikiLeaks until he got caught, uh, embezzling donated funds and, and, and Julian had to, had to fire him. Uh, he since got those two convictions I talked about and was offered this immunity. And now recently, uh, Tordeson, uh, re maybe I think a year ago, Tordeson recanted, uh, these statements about oh, Julian. Wow. Uh, and said, look, I lied for, uh, to get this immunity. So uh, this part of the indictment is just, you know, is, is crumbling apart this sort of narrative that, um, you know, Julian uh, was a hacker and these documents were hacked. Um, it, it's uh, just a non, a non-starter. Um, and that being said, you know, none of WikiLeaks has a hundred percent authenticity record. You know, ne there's never been uh, any document published uh, any information published that's been uh, put into question uh, of its authenticity. Uh, so I think the, that really speaks for itself that um, that information is in the public interest, uh, is, is authentic uh, and newsworthy. And so I think once you look back on that and, and say, well, uh, do, does the public deserve this to know this information regardless of where it came from? I think that's the sort of uh, how how this sort of info and and these revelations should be looked at through that through that lens rather than uh, where they came from. I think often often there's always this uh, attempt to sully uh, the the source, you know, whether it's a government employee or whether it's oh it's been hacked information, so the information uh, becomes less uh, worthy when in fact it's uh, Probably the most important uh, and the most revealing information uh, is the information that's stolen, either either by a government employee or or, or by someone else. What about this idea that the government has a right to decide what people can and can't know, and the First Amendment doesn't apply to information that the government has decided for itself should be kept secret, and WikiLeaks violated that? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, that I think. This information has uh, been the information that WikiLeaks published has been reported on by every single major newspaper in the world. Uh, you know, it, it is interesting to people. It is newsworthy. It is in the public interest, and the proof of that is that it's been reported. You know, so widely. Uh, you know, Julian's had more scoops than any uh, any other newspaper yeah. anywhere. You know, uh, around the world. I mean, if if uh, if it wasn't uh, in the public interest, if it wasn't important information, uh, then then you wouldn't see uh, you wouldn't see that. 
I mean, this is a sort of, uh, you know, an institutional uh, mindset to cover up uh, your own crimes, to, you know, cover up your own corruption or, or even just your own mistakes, you know, stupid mistakes that you make. Uh, you know, these institutions have this nature that uh, they, they don't want to share their mistakes or they don't want to share, uh, you know, obviously corruption and crimes. They, they use this classification then to, to hide that corruption and crimes, which is, um, you know, why this argument sort of doesn't stand up. Once, once you give these institutions this power, uh, they tend to um, use it uh, to, protect, to protect themselves. And, and really what it comes down to and what Julian, uh, you know, the, the sort of philosophy, I guess, uh, part of the philosophy behind WikiLeaks is that uh, a lot of these institutions, are, they're human institutions. And, you know, us yes. as human beings, as a society, uh, you know, we want to improve them uh, and, and we want to make them better. And so sharing this information and, and being transparent with the mistakes that are made or the crimes that are committed is the only way uh, that we can truly uh, make these institutions more effective uh, and, and able to serve us as uh, citizens of any country, uh, uh, make, make them serve us uh, better. Uh, it it kind of comes down to if the people knew what we were doing, they wouldn't trust us. And it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> that's that's your problem, not the people's yeah, problem. That's right. uh, the other big argument is as a result of WikiLeaks, a lot of American assets were personally killed uh, as a as all this information being made public. Is there any truth to that claim? No, none at all. Uh, and this is this is probably one of the most repeated lines by. Uh, you know, Secretary Blinken uh, was in Australia just two weeks ago, and he repeated these lies, you know, just, uh, you know, to the media in front of the Australian foreign minister who just uh, said to him that, you know, the Australian people wanted Julian Assange to be free. And he responded with this with this line that's saying, you know, Julian, um, you know, put lives in danger, uh, caused harm to uh, US uh, military personnel and defence personnel. Uh, and he repeated these lies. So uh, if you go back to the Chelsea Manning, Chelsea Manning being the leaker of, uh, of the information that Julian has charged you know, with publishing, uh, that in the Chelsea Manning trial, the Obama administration actually spent you know, over $10 million searching for people who uh, were harmed by the release of this information. And uh, it was the next general, General Carr, who, who made the statement to the court at the time saying that they couldn't find anybody. Uh, they couldn't find anybody who was physically harmed or killed uh, due to the release of, of this information. And in fact, uh, you know, I would say that the, this information actually saved lives. Uh, you know, it, it led to the end of, uh, to the withdrawal of troops, of American troops in Iraq. Uh, it, end, it led to the end of that war. Uh, and, and so, you know, I would argue that this uh, actually, this information actually saved American lives, uh, saved lives and saved countless lives uh, in, in Iraq and and around the world um, through through these releases. You know, led to uh, re regime changes throughout the Middle East during the Arab Spring uh, and different um, different events like that. So, uh, I would argue that this information actually uh, benefited people and saved lives rather than um, what, what the uh, what the DOJ is claiming, uh, which is a total fiction. It, it also speaks to the fact that how uh, cavalierly things are marked as classified and higher levels of classification, because if you would think, okay, I, there's a, there's an enormous asymmetry in American uh, um, public discourse that the public has a right to know. So if you're going to keep something from the public, you better have a darn good reason why this should be kept private. This is case, even legal cases, you know, like you go through this, you know, you're suing somebody, our dirty laundry is going to be out there because the public has a right to know, even if they're not a party to the case. So one would think that, okay, all this stuff's classified. It's being made public. Uh Oh, you know, people are going to be decapitated, kidnapped left and right. The fact that not, none of that happened speaks to the fact that this classification system was not meant to actually protect people from harm or 
a grievous injury or even worse. It was just there if people cover their ass and to not have any kind of accountability to the general public, something which to this day enrages them that they have to be held accountable or justifiable, justify their actions. And we, we're told every day here in the States that the job of journalists is to speak truth to power, hold powerful elites accountable. Like we're the ones who hold your feet to the fire. Uh, Caitlin Collins had this quote, about, I think it was Caitlin Collins, about how journalists like firefighters rushing towards the fire. In my opinion, they're arsonists. So they're going to the fire to see it with the mess that they started. But again, this is a great example of the fact that there's a, um, almost a pathological lack of intellectual curiosity and mm -hmm. a curiosity about facts in the media class. Otherwise, they'd be all over themselves with this stuff and wouldn't let up about all these myriad questions that these emails and other sorted telegrams and telegraphs uh, uh, have laid bare. Yeah, I think, and, and what's interesting about WikiLeaks and the way Julian worked was he sort of dragged this, these corporate media entities kicking and screaming into, this, in, into yeah. publishing this information. Uh, which they didn't like at all you know they it was embarrassing for them because they'd taken opposing positions previously so uh you know the way that uh, wikileaks worked and and that um you know this sort of uh concept of scientific journalism that that julian uh, spoke a lot about uh you know was a way of um exposing these journalists and and of course they don't like being exposed so they they came along and published alongside WikiLeaks a lot of this information because otherwise they would have been um, totally uh, embarrassed and exposed exactly uh, for what they are, as, as you said. Uh, let's talk a bit about the, the turmoil that he went through as a result of years. So he was trapped in an embassy in London. How long was his captivity in that embassy? Uh, seven years in, in uh, seven years so if he he was he not also like stuck to like literally one room for if he left that embassy which is sovereign soil of another nation there was no question obviously that he was going to be arrested there were there were warrants out for his arrest uh, uh how many countries at that point wanted his scalp well so there was an uh, international arrest warrant uh that was uh there was a there was around um, but during the time in the embassy, we knew there was like a, a what they call um, a sealed indictment um, that that um, you know had existed for quite uh, quite a long time, um, and so that that exists. The sealed indictment existed, and that was sort of revealed in a in a in a hiccup at the DOJ when they copy pasted some information into another indictment. Oh wow! Yeah, that that, uh, and so it was uh, revealed that that's that sealed indictment had existed for a very long time, but uh, he was wanted for breach of bail in the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, when he did go into the Ecuadorian re embassy and the Ecuadorians gave him asylum, uh, it wasn't for a uh, breach of bail charge, but you know, for, the, uh, for what they knew was coming, this uh, unprecedented espionage act prosecution uh, and, and the asylum was given uh, for that reason, that that the Ecuadorians knew that he would eventually uh, be wanted and taken uh, to the United States, so they gave him asylum in their embassy. Uh, he had police stationed right outside the door. There's two entries to the embassy, uh, and they had you know police stationed outside the door for many many years. Uh, you had plain clothes uh, grab teams that would sit uh, in cars outside the embassy. Um, it was it was a very well guarded, well monitored place. Uh, you had, uh, they even uh, bought the apartment across the street so they could, uh, you know, have eyes on Julian, um, you know, the entire time that he was in, in inside the embassy. And then and after 2017, in 2017, uh, WikiLeaks published uh, Vault 7, which was, uh, some publications about these CIA hacking tools that had been sort of let loose on the internet, um, that the CIA was not letting anybody know that they'd lost control of uh, some of their major hacking tools. And uh, WikiLeaks exposed, uh, exposed that, that these hacking tools were on the loose and, and what they could actually do, for instance, hacking to people's uh, Samsung televisions, turning them into listening devices, um, the hacking procedure for you know all types of mobile phones and different things like that, and at that time, 
uh, Mike Pompeo came out and said uh, that uh, WikiLeaks was a non-state hostile intelligence service. And what this, a lot of people were sort of a bit confused at the time, and what does this exactly mean? We haven't heard this before. But what it uh, meant, what this statement meant, uh, was that uh, the CIA could begin uh, clandestine operations against WikiLeaks, similar to what they would uh, what they would do against other government uh, other government intelligence services like uh, the Russian FSB or the Iranian Secret Service. They could now uh, do these clandestine uh, operations against uh, WikiLeaks. And so at that time you saw uh, the security company that was hired by the Ecuadorians that was meant to be protecting Julian inside the embassy uh, became a CIA cutout and they uh, installed high definition cameras all through the embassy. Uh, they installed microphones through the embassy as well. And these uh, footage and, and these listening devices, uh, that information was uh, taken back to the United States every 15 days uh, by the CEO of that security company. And this has all been uh, reported. Uh, there was, a, a, I think, a 6,000 word investigation done by three reporters in, in Washington that you know, cited over 30 intelligence sources uh, that said, yes, there were plans within the CIA, not just to spy on Julian, uh, but there were plots to uh, kidnap Julian that made it as high as the White House and also uh, plans uh, to murder him uh, that, that were uh, within the CIA. And then you had these leakers from within the security company. Uh, there's actually an ongoing court case in Spain that has summoned Mike Pompeo. Obviously, he's not going to go to go there. Yeah. Uh, but there's an ongoing court case uh, which uh, is, is prosecuting the, uh, the CEO of the security company. Uh, and a lot of the evidence they have is from people within this security company who leaked uh, all this information. And that's why you can still, you can go online and you can see footage of Julian. Uh, you know, you can see footage of Glenn Greenwald going to see Julian inside the embassy, uh, footage of Julian's lawyers visiting him. Uh, you know, you can see uh, Pamela Anderson's uh, mobile phone, the interior, the insides of her mobile phone when she went to visit Julian and they opened it up and took pictures uh, and wrote down the information that was inside the inside the mobile phone and then on sent that uh, back to the back to the intelligence services. Um, so it's, it's absolutely uh, shocking and incredible, you know, what happened in that embassy, uh, you know, that essentially the embassy essentially turned into a CIA black site that was in the, yeah, in, yeah. The, in the middle of London. Um, so uh, that seven year stay, although at the beginning, Julian had quite a lot of uh, freedoms inside that embassy. He could have visitors coming and going, and it was quite a, uh, you know, a rich intellectual life for him at that time. Um, after 2017, it really turned into, uh, you know, a prison and, and a very surveilled, um, uh, a very surveilled place. Folks, Jerome Powell and the Fed raised rates for the 11th time in July. The Hill has warned that it's a mistake that could spark a recession, and economists believe this is the last rate hike in the most aggressive rate hike cycle in history, and in fact, they're forecasting rate cuts in 2024. That's why bullish sentiment in gold for hedge funds just hit an 18-month high, and in fact, bullish sentiment for silver has risen at its fastest pace in more than five years years. JP Morgan Chase sees gold prices at record highs in 12 to 18 months. Rate hikes are typically headwinds for gold. Meanwhile, gold has gone up over 20% since 2022. Imagine where gold and silver are going to be when the Fed stops raising and starts cutting. So call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late and mention my name, Michael Malice. You'll always get best in class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver, and you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Here's what you have to do. Call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide, or simply go to malicegold.com. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row, so please call 888-505-9845 or just go to malicegold.com.
Folks, Michael Malice here, terrible author, horrible person on Twitter, and yes, sheath underwear model. Do you want to get inside my pants? Well, you can with sheath underwear. What's great about sheath is their dual pouch technology. They've got one pouch for one part of your male anatomy, another pouch for another part of your male anatomy. The first time I put them on, I'm like, what is this crap? But then I realized these are the most comfortable underwear I've ever worn. I wear them every single day. It was developed by Bobby, who was an Iraq vet. So you know things get uncomfortable down there when you're in the desert. And I've designed my own pair. If you go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off. And you could start one step closer to becoming an underwear model just like myself, but not as much of a terrible person like myself. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, get 20% off today. What's great about this underwear is that it keeps you cool in the hot weather and it keeps you snug and secure uh, in any situation. And there's something a little subversive about being like, let's say, on a date or a job interview and knowing that your underwear is cupping your you-know-what downstairs sheathunderwear.com promo code malice for 20 percent off let's get back to the show what was your personal reaction when you first learned indisputably i'm sure this was something you'd suspected previously in writing that there is a cia plot to kidnap and kill your brother yeah look i mean i i, I um uh, at the time i wasn't really uh surprised to be honest um, okay. Yeah, you know, we we uh, you know Ju- Julian's work and WikiLeaks's work has uh, you know always uh, made those in power very fearful uh, and yeah. and made them very afraid and and they have these tools at their disposal and and uh, you know I wasn't really surprised that they'd uh, go and try and you know figure out ways to use them against Julian. I um, mean, you know, the CIA p- perfectly capable of. <laughs> of uh, killing journalists. I mean, there's that, that classic meme, right? Where, you know, the CIA gives journalism awards and they're actually bullets with uh, journalism, journalist names written on them. Um, so yeah, I wasn't, wasn't really surprised at all um, to, to find out that those plots, uh, plots existed. I was surprised that people actually, that the sources actually confirmed them. Uh, that, that was right. quite surprising that the CIA was like leaking on itself. Um, you know, to journalists, uh, I, I found that quite interesting that there was some um, dysfunction and disagreement within the CIA about, um, you know, about these plots and, and whether they, whether that's what the uh, agency was, uh, you know, meant to be doing or what it was created for doing. I think there's still some, uh, you know, very patriotic people within the CIA who, you know, they've taken an oath to defend the Constitution. And I think they, I uh, take that very seriously. So, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, surprised and sort of heartened to know that there are still some, uh, you know, good people within the intelligence community in the United States. Yeah, one of the, you know, there's a lot of people I know in, in who are very black pilled who think it's a wrap, freedom is gone, and so on and so forth. And you know, the people who I would regard as the enemy class are going to have their way, and. If they had their way, he would be dead. I mean, it's not even a question. This is absolutely what they wanted. They want, and I think I think people also underestimate the nature of how, uh, you know, what Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil in bureaucracies, mm. and how. And I'm thinking my last book, The White Pill, you know, speaks on this with the end of the Cold War, where they before he was elected president, I believe they brought Reagan as candidate into the bunker, and they're they're showing him kind of you know how to retaliate if Russia throws nukes. And he's like, whoa, 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 like you want me to just press this and I'm just killing like more of the people than Hitler, like in seconds. And like your answer is just to have more and more missiles. Like that's, and like there's the kind of this kind of bureaucratic momentum. It's just like, you just keep piling yeah. on and no one stops as, as thankfully some people the CIA seem to do. It's like, hold on a second here, guys. Like have, have we lost the plot? And it's actually kind of funny because at the same time, Gorbachev uh, was walked through this and you know, they, there was this fear of Star Wars, which is Reagan's idea of having missiles from space shoot down nukes. And his colleagues were like, well, we'll just have a bunch of dummy missiles so they can't shoot them all down. And then we're going to make sure the nukes go through. And he's like, this isn't making it better that we're absolutely sure we're going to kill all life on Earth. You're making it worse. So it's very heartening to hear that there were still elements, even in an organization as what I regard as malevolent CIA, who still have a bit of their conscience and can publicly 
say, guys, this is wrong. Uh, this is not what we should be doing. So that is heartening. Can you talk about what changed from the Ecuadorian government allowing him to have uh, um, sanctuary and them deciding to give him up? What pressures were they under? Well, the, there was a change of, uh, change of government in, in Ecuador. Uh, so, you know, Rafael Correa, who was the president, uh, you know, at the time who gave Julian, you know, a sanctuary and asylum, uh, his uh, deputy was elected uh, to president. president. Um, everybody thought that that was going to be good. Uh, you know, Lenin Moreno, Moreno was his name. Um, you know, people thought uh, that he was going to be sort of, you know, the effective replacement of Correa and that he would continue on his policies. Um, but the sort of opposite, uh, the opposite was true. Um, and then there was a, a quite a large uh, campaign around, um, you know, getting uh, Moreno uh, on board with um, with going after Julian, essentially. Um, you know, there was IMF loans involved, billion dollar IMF loans. Uh, Mike Pence actually made a trip to Ecuador. You know, this, Ecuador is a country of 4 million people. <laughs> And uh, Mike Pence actually traveled there, the first American uh, vice president in history uh, to do a state visit um, to Ecuador. Uh, and so it was around that time that, um, you know, around that 2017 era, that time when um, the government in Ecuador became very hostile towards uh, Julian in the embassy and, and, and came under a lot of that pressure um, to, uh, to, um, you know, withdraw Julian's asylum and 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 kick him out of, of the embassy. Now, there's uh, an opera. You know, there was a, an operation uh, in in the United Kingdom, um, and and it was actually uh, there, there was a, a part of the foreign ministry there. This uh, fellow, I can't remember his first name, Duncan uh, was his last name, but he was the, you know the foreign essentially the foreign minister for uh, Latin America, and in his um, memoir uh, for the time that he was uh, in that position, he spoke about operation, what they called Operation Pelican, uh, which was a operation that he worked on uh, to essentially get Julian out of the embassy and the different um, ways that they needed to do that, the different layers of the campaign uh, that they needed to wage um, to get Julian out of the embassy. And part of that was uh, flipping the government uh, in Ecuador, uh, convincing them that they could withdraw. They actually gave, Ecuador gave Julian citizenship, so they had to illegally uh, take back Julian citizenship. Um, they had to illegally withdraw his asylum that they'd given, and then they had to let, you know, let police officers into, you know, like you said earlier, their sovereign territory. They had to let UK uh, police into their sovereign territory. So there was quite a bit of work that happened. Uh, around that operation, Operation Pelican, one of the major problems that they had uh, in getting Julian out of the embassy is uh, Julian was immensely popular in Ecuador, uh, immensely popular among the people of Ecuador. Uh, Julian had exposed uh, what the corruption of previous Ecuadorian governments um, and how they weren't really working for the Ecuadorian people. Uh, and, and so there was, um, you know, Julian, enjoyed uh, popular support in Ecuador. And so uh, part of that campaign, part of the problem that they had to solve was like, okay, how do we um, make Julian less popular in Ecuador? How do we yeah. make this palatable to the Ecuadorian people? And so that's when you saw really how these, how the corporate media works hand in glove with uh, the intelligence organizations and government. And, and we saw a concerted media campaign around Julian uh, you know, being called called a bad house guest. You know, there's. I think the Guardian must have published, you know, five or six stories around this about you know, Julian smearing poo on the on the wall of the Ecuadorian embassy, Julian not feeding his cat, Julian not doing the washing up inside the Ecuadorian embassy. All these sort of stories. Um, the most famous one is the uh, Paul Manafort visiting the embassy, uh, Trump's campaign advisor or campaign manager which was a total fiction, uh, the, the most surveilled place, one of the most surveilled place on earth. And there is no record 
of Paul Manafort ever visiting ever visiting this the Ecuadorian embassy, but somehow this managed to be a front page news story in the Guardian newspaper in the United Kingdom. Uh, and, and that was part of this concerted effort, this Operation Pelican, uh, to make it look like that Julian uh, was, um, you know, an unwanted house guest to the Ecuadorians, um, that he was, uh, you know, operating a sort of uh, campaign influence uh, operation from within the embassy and that he should be uh, ejected from there. So uh, it was interesting and revealing that Duncan felt uh, felt uh, the confident enough to publish all of this uh, in in his in his memoir. One striking uh, anecdote is that when Julian was eventually evicted from the embassy, Duncan travelled uh, to Ecuador and gave his counterpart who was involved uh, in the operation a gift plate from Buckingham Palace uh, uh, as a present. <laughs> like, here is your reward for getting Julian out, yeah. out of the prison. So uh, I think, you know, history is going to uh, very look look very poorly on some of the characters that were involved in, uh, in Julian's persecution. I, I just want to be crystal clear that I'm misunderstanding something because Mike Pence is a candidate for the presidency in the 2024 election. When he went to Ecuador, it wasn't to be on Julian's side and to lobby to make sure that he's protected. He went there to encourage the Ecuadorian government to give him up, correct? Yeah, that's right. And and they held a, I think it was, okay. a billion, I think it was $4 billion, a $4 billion IMF loan. Uh, they sort of held that as a, you know, you if you do this, you'll get this $4 billion IMF loan. Um, and and also, I, uh, I think Rafael Correa, he, um, uh, he pushed the U.S. bases out and then Lennon Moreno let U.S. bases back in. So uh, that that's uh, what Mike Pence uh, did. You know, that's what his effort there in, um, in Ecuador. What is his current status uh, in terms of his captivity? And what is he facing in terms of legal threats? So uh, Julian has been, uh, he was taken from that embassy in 2019. Uh, April 11th, and so he's been, uh, he was taken from there, put in a maximum security prison uh, in London. It's called uh, Belmarsh. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the harshest prison in, in Britain, yeah. place for the most dangerous, most violent uh, criminals. Um, he is kept essentially in his cell 23, 22 hours a day. Um, He's been there, yeah, it's his fifth year in that prison now. He's been there four years on, on April 11th. Uh, and he's held there, um, he's not convicted. He's not serving a sentence. He's held there solely uh, in relation to a extradition, uh, an extradition request from uh, the United States. The Department of Justice has charged Julian uh, with 17 counts under the Espionage Act. Uh, for publishing uh, publishing this information from the Chelsea Manning leaks, so that's Iraq war logs, Afghan Afghanistan war diaries, uh, diplomatic cables set, uh, the Guantanamo Bay detainee files. All that information is uh, what Julian is charged with uh, publishing um, and actually just possessing <laughs> uh, that information is is part of part of that Espionage Act uh, prosecution. And so he's been fighting that uh, for the last four years. Uh, he has one final uh, avenue of appeal in the UK courts. Uh, he has submitted a 20 page uh, application to appeal and he is awaiting a hearing in front of two high court judges. Uh, now that in that hearing, if those uh, judges uh, do not give leave to appeal or approve his application to appeal, uh, they can uh, extradite Julian within 24 hours um, and that would extradite him. Uh, he would be put on a plane uh, and taken to the Eastern District uh, of Virginia, which is the um, where, where he's been charged with those Espionage, espionage Act uh, charges. And that, that, um, that court's colloquial, colloquially known as the Espionage Court. You know, it's where all these Espionage Act prosecutions emanate from. Uh, and it, and it is uh, chosen for that reason is that it, you know 
99.9% conviction rate. Uh, its jury pool is drawn from uh, you know, military contractors, um, defense uh, and intelligence services. Uh, which are all based around their family, friends, uh, all, all the jury pool is drawn from that area. And it's for that very reason that um, that court is used as the uh, place where these espionage act prosecutions uh, emanate from. Now, these it's a very contentious prosecution. It's a novel use of the espionage act to go after a publisher. Uh, it it criminalizes, um, you know, just retaining this information, you know, every newsroom in the, yeah. in the United States has has classified yeah. information in it. So under this prosecution, uh, every single newsroom uh, would 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 be able to be pr prosecuted. It also criminalizes the uh, source uh, the source journalist relationship. So communication between a source um, and a journalist, communication about uh, you know saying to a source, okay, use use encryption to hide your identity. That sort of communication uh, then becomes part of a conspiracy to, to steal information. So it really is criminalizing all these different aspects of, of national security, uh, journalism. Um, and that is why you have these, every single major uh, press freedom, uh, First Amendment and human rights organization in the United States, uh, 26 of them have written multiple letters to the Garland Department of Justice calling on him to drop these charges uh, because of the threat they pose to to everybody essentially uh, and particularly news organizations uh, and that's why you've seen as I said before the New York Times sending a letter to the Garland uh, administration um, you also have some some efforts within Congress and the Senate um, to reform the espionage act um, that would allow for what's called a public interest defense, uh, which, which it currently doesn't allow for. Uh, it doesn't allow the defendant to argue that, well, you know, this information was in the public interest, which is why I published it or why I stole it. So there is, um, it is a controversial prosecution. It is a new use of this law. Um, and uh, there are a lot of people who are fighting against it, not just uh, Julian, uh, of course. Folks, your welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. And let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming, like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking, your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try. You might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive, collision coverage, or personal injury protection. Then you'll see a Progressive direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Let's get back to the show. Uh, um, the UK and the US very famously have a so-called special relationship, uh, and and they work hand in glove on many many issues. Uh, the Iraq War perhaps might be the most notorious example in recent years. Why is it taking so long to get this extradition? I would think this would be just be a rubber stamp that the US snaps their fingers and Great Britain's just tripping over themselves to deliver whoever they want. Well, I think, you know, the sort of purpose of this prosecution is being served if, if Julian is uh, imprisoned indefinitely, you know, it's sort of a signal to everybody um, right. in the United Kingdom and overseas anywhere that uh, the United States Department of Justice can reach in uh, to your country uh, and, and pluck you out and keep you in jail uh, indefinitely uh, if you publish this sort of information. Uh, so, so it's this sort of global, it's this extraterritorial ac application of U.S. secrecy law, uh, U.S. espionage law, uh, on journalists anywhere around the world. And we often forget that you know the the United States has, um, you know, uh, for all its, um, you know, it, it, the laws they're protecting speech are very, are very robust. You know, and are sort of emulated all around the world. 
um, you know, Julian often talked about that he wanted to export the First Amendment uh, to the to, yeah. to the rest of the world. Um, the, the First Amendment it, it doesn't exist in the United Kingdom. The media landscape there is is very closed. Um, they have what they call D notices, which is where all the news they actually have a meeting where all the newspapers and the intelligence services get together on a monthly basis and decide what they're going to publish. Um, so, you know, the United Kingdom, I think, is more than a, a um, you know, they're, they're more than an equal partner in this in this prosecution uh, of Julian Assange. Uh, you just, you know, if you look back uh, to the Snowden archives or the Snowden files, the Guardian newspaper actually let uh, MI5, MI6 inside their building and uh, watched as they smashed up the computers and, and things that, that were storing this archive, you know, back in 2014, 2015. So uh, that's the sort of media landscape that exists uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, so, yeah, I, I believe they're more than equal partners in this. And, you know, it's in their interest as well to uh, stop this sort of publishing. Uh, and and keep and set that example to everybody else that if you do this, you will be in our most secure, most harshest uh, prison. But what I mean is, why are they not handing him over then for so long? Well, I I, I think that, like I said, this example has been set. Uh, if if, okay. uh, if Julian is is extradited, uh, you know, I I believe that you know, and I've spoken to a lot of people there that. That it, you know, as soon as it touches down on U.S. soil, that's when the attention from the, the media there will be uh, more focused. You know, the, the, they'll be reporting on okay. court proceedings yeah. and things like that. So, um, as long as uh, Julian remains in, in prison, as long as the court case isn't proceeding, um, you know, it's sort of done quietly in a way. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. More quietly for the administration, more quietly. Uh, for for the people who are pursuing this, um, uh, you know, the the purpose is served. Julian's in prison indefinitely, um, yeah. and and they don't have to undergo the scrutiny um, that that a uh, prosecution in the Eastern District of Virginia would would undergo. I mean, you know, this case Julian's case is filled with criminality, you know, and not on Julian's part, but on the yeah, part, on right, the part of right, the people yeah. who have been pursuing them, and and I don't believe that they would want that uh, sort of um, under the microscope, uh, you know, uh, in, in any court. And I think that's why we're seeing now, you know, a couple of days ago, we had comments from the US amb ambassador here in Australia, uh, and she made comments that, you know, the DOJ uh, was open to a resolution uh, in this case. So I think you see what we're sort of seeing is this, um, you know, the Biden administration they, they don't they don't want this as something extra on their plate you know they've got uh, enough problems uh, as it is with um, you know the Department of Justice at the moment uh, having this You're right. having this uh, case uh, running out during an election cycle I think could be very damaging for them which is why I think we're seeing this signaling from the State Department from people like Carolyn Kennedy um, that that, a res that 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 the DOJ is open to some sort of resolution. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right because if he's on trial here, then you're going to automatically have the Republicans and conservatives who are just going to react to whatever Biden's for, and to have all of conservatism aligned with the New York Times uh, in Julian's side, that is really going to be. A, I mean, I wouldn't want to go up against you know those two. T I mean. I, the last time they teamed up, they got the Iraq war passed, right? Yeah. So it really becomes a formidable force to try to argue against why you trying to persecute someone who's already persecuted for years for publishing information that you knew was true at the time and has over the years only been demonstrated to be uh, um, factual and, and honest, uh, unlike uh, most of the things coming out of uh, many official agencies. Um, wh what is his... Uh, this is a tough question, but is he allowed phone cals with you? Is he allowed letters? Is he allowed visitors? Like, what's his state of mind, yeah, as well, best you can say? I, I think that's one thing about the prison conditions in the United Kingdom. They are very harsh, uh, but he is allowed visits. He gets two visits a week from his family. He's allowed to see his children. He has two young children that he um, oh, uh, had gosh. in the Ecuadorian embassy with his wife, Stella. So uh, that's really his lifeline. 
You know, that's what's keeping him of alive. Course, yes. Uh, and as harsh as those prison conditions are, uh, he does get those uh, small things that uh, keep a connection going to the outside world. And even though, you know, I talk about this case not being wanted in the United States, um, you know, on its merits and, and, and on, on the criminality that's surrounding it. But, you know, at the center, there's still this man um, and, and how he would be treated when, if he is extradited. Uh, yeah. And so that's why we're fighting this as well, that, you know, fighting this tooth and nail, this extradition, because if he is extradited, uh, you know, he'll be lost into this uh, prison system in the US. Um, you know, there's all these, he could be put in any type of these sort of uh, CMU, which is communications management uh, unit, or even, um, you know, the uh, SAMS, which is special administrative measures, which is how the, what the different prison conditions that are, are placed on uh, people who, you know, no classified information or, or, or different things like that. So that's what we're really afraid of, that Julian will not be able to survive those conditions. Um, but at the moment, he is getting that support from his family, seeing his children, and he's able to talk with his lawyers, uh, you know, on a okay. daily basis as well. So as bad as the prison conditions are in the United Kingdom, they, he faces much worse if extradited to the United States. Uh, Chelsea Manning famously got her sentence commuted by President Obama. The fact that she's a trans woman certainly played into that in terms of lobbying the president to uh, for her release. Um, I heard a rumor that towards the end of his presidency, uh, Donald Trump was seriously considering pardoning or pardoning his sentence. Uh, can you speak if there is, uh, I don't know if you could speak of this publicly, if there's any truth to those claims? Yeah, well, I can. I mean, we know that, uh, you know, the people, many, many people uh, were working on that very, very hard. Many congressmen, uh, congressmen and women, you know, Tucker Carlson lobbied uh, Trump uh, very, uh, you know, extremely hard to pardon uh, Julian Assange. We know that, uh, you know, the pardon was drawn up. The pardon was on Trump's desk. Uh, wow. Okay. And that, um, you know, Tucker, I think I Tucker reported at the time, that, uh, you know, Trump got a call from McConnell, Mitch McConnell, and said, you know, your impeachment is not going to go well for you if you do this. Uh, and, and so that that was what was, you know, reported at the time. I don't know what how, how true that is, um, but, right. um, you know, that, that, that was sort of reported at the time that McConnell would give him a call and, and that, um, you know, would say to him, look, you do this and you, your impeachment's not going to go well for you. But we know it was very close. Uh, and we know that those pardons, you know, were drawn up and ready to be signed. And there was a lot of uh, back and forth from within, inside those who were the, who were pushing it and, and, inside, and those who were against it uh, inside the Trump administration. Um, you know, you've had comments from, uh, you know, Don Jr. recently, um, you know, saying that he's changed his position on Snowden and Assange. Um, and, that, and that he believes that, um, you know, that they shouldn't be prosecuted. I mean, Trump's not on the record uh, just yet of saying anything uh, along those lines. Uh, but people like Robert Kennedy Jr., uh, uh, Vivek Ramasamy uh, is on the record saying that he would pardon Julian Assange, uh, as well as, you know, people like uh, from the left, like Marianne Williamson and, and Cornel West, uh, all these sort of presidential hopefuls uh are seeing it as a vote winner actually <laughs> uh to yeah. to say that um they'll come out and uh, make a move towards transparency because i think people you know a lot of people are tired uh, particularly after the pandemic and what's coming out uh, about that 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 you know that there's no transparency in government and they need people like uh, julian assange and wikileaks uh to to do that essential role uh that that's part of the democracy uh, can you, off the top of your head, give us a list of who you would call, I'm sure you're going to forget some names of the good guys, like who were the big names in terms of journalists and politicians who have been fighting to uh, free your brother? Well, Thomas Massey, you know, Thomas Massey is a very strong, yes. uh, strong one. Rand Paul, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, on, these are on the right. Paul Gosar, um, those are the on the right. People like Ro Khanna, um, you have... Uh, 
squad members like Rashida Talib, Ilhan Omar, um, they, they've all been very strong uh, for Julian in the Congress. Um, not so many on the Democratic senator side. I know Bernie Sanders did speak out when it was um, a Trump prosecution, but has kept his mouth uh, shut uh, since Biden's been in office. Uh, you have uh, reporters like you know, Matt Tybee, uh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, very, very supportive. Um, the, yeah, there's, there's a lot and they're growing. They're, they're, they're growing magazines like Harper's, uh, Forbes, uh, all supportive publications uh, who have been re writing really good uh, material on Julian. Uh, there's a great Harper's article uh, that goes into all the smears, uh, the, all the smears about Julian that we spoke about. And it's a really good read about the misconceptions around around um, around um, Julian and his uh, prosecution over the years. So yeah, there's a lot of people doing great work on this. Um, Consortium News, and Joe Laurier, he's, he's excellent uh, as well. He's been on this case for many, many years. So uh, there are many out there, Michael, including yourself, I, I suppose. So yeah, thank you very much. Tucker Carlson, I should, I should mention as well. I mean, Tucker's yeah, been on this, uh, you know, from almost day one uh, reporting on this. The the fact, you know, it's very easy for us sitting on this side of the bars to try to encourage him to have hope. Uh, and you have to on some level. The fact that Carolyn Kennedy, who's the official, who's a Kennedy, who's the official U.S. ambassador to Australia, publicly said, like, we're going to work, we have the possibility of working toward negotiation. This woman is not some kind of loose cannon. I, I mean, this is a Kennedy. Like, she is a team player. She's a Democratic Party through and through. So she would not have floated that out there without someone in the Biden administration, in my opinion, giving her, telling her, hey, throw this out there. That to me is one of the most hopeful things about this case I've heard in years. Um, and uh, it just seems that, uh, and, and on the other side of the aisle, if Trump's big uh, redemption arc with his people is this time I'm really going to take on the deep state, there's no better way to give the finger to the deep state than to pardon the man who exposed their depravity and malfeasance. And it's not just, you know, corruption in the sense of, hey, you know, I'm gonna hire my brother and he's gonna pay five thousand, we're gonna pay him five thousand dollars for this toilet and everyone gets a cut. This is lies that cost hundreds of thousands of lives, destroyed entire nations. Mm. I mean, killed children. How many kids were killed, you know, with no consequence. So uh, I, I am very, very hopeful after I saw that article drop over the weekend uh, that that the ball is moving in the direction we would want it to. Yeah, I hope so too. And it's credit to all those people I mentioned as well as, uh, you know, campaigners all around the world have been, you know, slaving away at this for years and years and all the new people who have joined the advocacy as well. It's real credit to them um, that, that we've gotten to this to this point, you know, and I think in this campaign, you always say, you know, you don't know what, you don't know what's going to, what it's going to take, what, 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 what right. is the next action that's going to, um, you know, that's going to really break, break this, but um, it can't exist without all the previous, <laughs> all the previous yes. work. So yeah, um, credit to all those people as well. Uh, how can people uh, support Julian? Uh, in what way is the best way to support him? And how could they do so? Well, in the United States, you can go to AssangeDefense.org. Uh, it has actions that are taking place all across the country. If you want to get involved in direct action, uh, you can join the mailing list that has updates that come out, you know, weekly or monthly basis. Um, you can also donate there and AssangeDefense.org uh, in the United States is the sort of center for, for the U.S. campaign at the moment. Uh, Gabe, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Uh, I mean, it's always refreshing to, um, you know, I think, yeah, you're, it's refreshing to speak to people who have an understanding of, um, you know, the, the machinations of the, of the corporate media and, and, and how all those things work and um, yeah, being given an opportunity to work backwards through all the smears and things like that is always, yeah. um, is always good to communicate to the, to, to people, but yeah, I think um, yeah, you have a you have a great understanding of, of 
um, you know, the landscape and, and, and uh, how things work there. So it's always good to talk to people um, like that. You are welcome. Have you ever heard that story that Napoleon used the Egyptian Sphinx for target practice and shot its nose off? Or maybe you've heard that a French astrologer named Nostradamus correctly predicted nearly 500 years of human history. Or maybe someone told you that the legendary blues guitarist Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at a crossroads in Mississippi. These stories are what I like to call historical myths, great little tales that may or may not have any basis in historical fact. On Our Fake History, we explore these historical myths and try to determine what's fact, what's fiction, and what is such a good story. It simply must be told. If you dig stories about death-obsessed emperors, lost civilizations, desperate sieges, voodoo black magic, and famous historical figures you thought you knew, then Our Fake History might just be your new favorite podcast. If you dig it, then subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts.